If we never have a turnaround in our lives, we just keep going the same direction and we keep doing the same things we've already done and we keep getting the same results we've already had, always had. And this is, uh, th this is part of God's plan. There, there are turnaround points where he changes things and that's one of the fascinating parts of this series in 1 Samuel is it's full of turnaround stories. And I'm believing that in some of our lives, there's going to be major turnarounds this year where we need them. Um, Pastor Anthony uh, did a wonderful job last week uh, talking about a turnaround in the wrong direction, and it's really helpful to know why. He talk, traced King Saul in a wonderful message, how his impatience and his need to please people and his, his partial obedience to God, not full obedience, led him to to a turnaround in his own life that resulted in God taking his hand off of his life. However, God wants the kinds of turnarounds in our lives where he puts his hand on our lives in fresh and new ways. And we're not just doing what we've always done. We're not just addicted to the old things we always were addicted to. We're, we're, just, not, we're just not out there on our own like we used to be. But, but he's turned us around, bringing us closer to his own heart. And one of the areas where probably uh, turnarounds will involved in, will happen in a lot of our lives is turnarounds in relationships. And I want to talk today about refocusing our relationships. It just seems that a lot of our relationships aren't working well these days. And turnarounds going to mean something's changing with the people who are closest to us or need to be close to us. And today we're going to be looking at somebody in the book of First Samuel, somebody who avoids the, the trap of, on one hand, staying too much to himself, and on the other hand, making every relationship all about himself. And we, we walk in between those two things. And in the midst of it all, we find a powerful picture of Jesus and what he did for us. And that's the relationship we all need to start with. So the person who kind of leads the way in this very unique friendship is Jonathan. His name is Jonathan. A few weeks ago, we talked about him, if you were here. And uh, let, let's just remember this, uh, this, this verse that set up an incredible moment in Jonathan's life. It's 1 Samuel 14, verse 6. Jonathan said to his young armor bearer, Come, let's go over to the outpost of these uncircumcised men. And that would be the enemy, the Philistines, sort of our favorite bad guys in 1 Samuel. He said, perhaps the Lord will work on our behalf. Nothing can hinder the Lord from saving, whether by many or by few. So what does he do? He just believes that. And with one sword, he and his armor bearer attack an entire army all by themselves, because nobody else will do anything. And they win, <laughs> because God intervenes in a pretty powerful way, because he is able by many or by few. So we meet Jonathan in chapter 14, this hero. And his father, actually, he's really Prince Jonathan. His father is the first king of Israel, Saul. And of course, it takes two to make a friendship. So the other young hero we meet three chapters later is David. Actually, two chapters later in chapter 16, he is visited by the prophet Samuel. He's anointed to be the next king of Israel. And, uh, in the, and it said from the time that he was anointed to be that, the Spirit of God came on him with power. And the very next chapter is the most famous story in the Bible, David defeating the giant, again, all by himself, with the intervention of God. Remember what David said in verse, verse 45 of 1 Samuel 17. David said to the Philistine, you come against me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come against you in the name of the Lord. So we see the same spirit in David that was in Jonathan. I come against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. So here's two young men who have a passion, a common passion, for the glory of God's name among his people and who are willing to risk their lives to stand for the glory of, and honor of God's name. And uh, as a result, they become like the best of friends. 
1 Samuel 18, verse 1, where we'll be spending some time today. And David, after David had finished talking with Saul, so he kills the, Goliath, the giant. Israel wins a great battle against the enemy that was after them. And then uh, he goes and David talks to King Saul. David's been a no-name shepherd boy from Bethlehem up to this moment. And he talks to Saul, and he meets his son, Jonathan. And Jonathan and David become one in spirit, for Jonathan loved David as himself. It reminds us of what Jesus said when he said, we ought to love our neighbors as ourselves. I mean, this was true, authentic connection and friendship that these two men had. And you, you do understand, they're, they're both these heroes, they both have this same heart for God and for God's people and everything. Although, just think about it a moment. In some ways, this is a very unlikely relationship. First of all, could I be honest with you, there's a lot of male hormones here in two young men in which, you know, good-natured competitiveness could easily become pretty toxic and pretty adversarial. Plus, one of these guys has a lot to lose in the friendship. It's not David, the unknown shepherd boy. It's the prince. It's Prince Jonathan. Because David is the one who's been chosen already to be the next king of Israel. And Jonathan is the one, however, who's the son of the king. He's entitled to be the next king of Israel. And as we will see this relationship between David and Jonathan will end up complicating Jonathan's life incredibly. But their hearts were bound together. And the question is, how did they become friends instead of rivals? I mean, how did this actually happen? And it's the two things that Jonathan does that I think can be keys to turnarounds in some critical relationships in our own lives. And, and they're the kind of they're the kind of things that Jesus himself lived out a thousand years later when he came. And it's because of Jesus that I think we really, I know that we can see some refocused relationships that bring big turnarounds in our lives. And uh, so the question's in front of us. How, how did Jonathan and David do that? How, how did they avoid just being rivals? And how did Jonathan avoid being threatened by David? Well, well first of all, Jonathan resisted the temptation to keep to himself, just to keep to himself. We call this isolation. Um, that's, that's a growing temptation these days. It seems as on one hand, loneliness is growing in our culture. You, you know how we often deal with loneliness? We just, we, we, just feel, we just feel the risk of rejection if we try to address our loneliness that that we tend to stay more isolated. It seems like as loneliness grows, it kind of reinforces our, our, our fear of getting close to people and we stay more and more isolated from people. And Jonathan, even though this young shepherd boy is a guy who's gonna replace him as, as, the, as a rightful next king of Israel, um, his heart is bound to David and he initiates in Old Testament language, what we call a covenant, or what in our day, if we look at a marriage, we would call it a covenant. And he forms this covenant. Look, look at it right there in verse, uh, uh, in, in verse three of First Samuel 18. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as, him as himself. And Jonathan then did a weird thing. He took off his robe that he was wearing and he gave it to David along with his tunic. So these two pieces of clothing, but he doesn't stop there. And then he gives David his weapons. He gave David his sword and his bow and his belt. Now two things are happening here. First of all, for a no-name shepherd boy from Bethlehem to have the prince put his own garments on, his, on, 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 on David's shoulders, I mean, that was an amazing statement of affirmation. I mean, I think all our friends ought to feel more lifted up when we're done with them than, than put down. And he's just lifting him up here. But in covenants, like in the covenant of marriage, there's an exchange of rings, there's symbols. When ancient covenants would be forged in friendship or 
in what we might today call contracts between people, there usually was an exchange. And, and this exchange pledged loyalty. And if I could reduce Jonathan giving his robes to David and giving his weapons to David to one thing, it would simply be this. Jonathan was saying to David, I've got your back. I'll give you my weapons. I'm going to be weaponless, vulnerable, but I'll give you my weapons to say that I'll fight for you. I'll fight for you when you're there. I'll fight for you when you're not there. I'm pledged in loyalty to you. And I'll give you my, my garments, like my identity. I mean, I'm willing to associate myself, to identify myself with you in public, no matter what people think of you. This, this is this powerful covenant exchange in which... Uh, in which Jonathan initiates this pledge of loyalty. And of course, covenant is what our relationship with Jesus is all about. Before Jesus died on the cross, he, the night before, he took a cup and bread, and he said, this cup represents my, the new covenant in my blood, and the bread represents my body for you. It's like he took the initiative so that by his shed blood our sins could be forgiven by the brokenness of his body. We could be met in our brokenness and we could be healed. This is not Bible Belt stuff. This is not try harder in a self-improvement project. This is God making a covenant on his own initiative with you and me and then he sits there waiting for us to say yes to it. And David said yes to this covenant. And in the process, we see a guy, Jonathan, who doesn't keep his distance, who, who doesn't too much keep to himself. And, and th th this, this might be part of our responsibility in refocusing the relationships in our lives. There may be some places where we're just too much keeping to ourselves, where we're not taking the initiative, where we're, you know, ah, for months I planned to have lunch with that person, but I mean, maybe this week you'll actually get on your phone and text somebody and schedule a lunch meeting. I mean, we, we just can some, in our busyness and in our loneliness, in all of our excuses, and what if they don't want to have lunch with me and all of these things. The first three minutes at the end of a service, I think, are, are solid gold after service ends. You either just keep to yourself and you walk out and don't say anything to anybody, or you view yourself as God's person on mission at all times, and of course I'm just going to try to to welcome somebody before I leave, just to give a word of encouragement to somebody, or at least acknowledge that they're there. I mean, you don't know how God could use that. It's like we don't keep to ourselves. There are people who say, I, I never want to be in a small group, and I would never pray out loud for somebody, especially right in front of them. I mean, I would just never see my... And I'm going, look, you're full of the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to be. We're God's people. I mean, you know what? If we just keep keeping to ourselves and living insular lives, uh, we're going to abort half of what God wants to do through our lives. Jonathan didn't do this. He took the initiative, just like God did with us in Jesus. And he made a covenant with this guy. Now, I'm not asking you to make a covenant with anybody. I'm just saying don't stay too close. Don't, don't stay too much to yourself. Resist that temptation. And on the other end of the spectrum, resist the temptation, if you are in relationship with people, to make it all about yourself. And I think this is where the cultural winds are blowing right now for us. Jo Jonathan resisted the temptation to make the relationship with David all about himself. I mean, if it was all about himself, he wouldn't have formed this relationship. We, we have a word for it. It's called narcissism. Chuck DeGroat recently came out with a book, When Narcissism Comes to Church. Don't you hate that title? But it's happening. That's why this is an important subject. He said, naively, I assume most Christians were all about navigating the humble way. So when I first, when I met my first Christian quote unquote celebrity while I was still in high school I expected an incarnated form of Jesus on stage he wooed and wowed with arms waving and a smile so big you could see it from the back row of the auditorium but when I met him in person afterwards he was distant and cold far from a Jesus incarnation 
and way above a conversation with some teenage fan, too self-important for trivial encounters like this one. On that day, he writes, I felt narcissism's ugly bite. And about 10 years later, narcissism's bite returned with a vengeance, this time from a charming and charismatic ministry peer whose affirmations of me would cause my soul to soar, but whole secretive, suspicious, and sometimes sinister machinations confused and even frightened me. That's life with a narcissist. And after a season of feeling like it was me that was crazy, I sat with a therapist who said in no uncertain terms, you're dealing with a narcissist. Who's, what's a narcissist? It's a self-absorbed person who makes life all about themselves. If you're married to a narcissist, I've met a few who are, it's a tough life. And thank God for your loyalty and your pledge. And you should always draw the line if it ever becomes abusive. But on the other hand, you know that everything in your life is about meeting the needs of the other person. Because a narcissist is self-absorbed. Life's all about them. We use people to meet our needs. We don't serve people to lift them up. A narcissist can't see life from another person's perspective. They can only see. They're just absorbed with themselves. And they have to be the starring role in the movie. And everybody else is a supporting cast to make them look good. That's narcissism. I actually looked up narcissism in, uh, this past week in Miriam De- uh, Webster's dictionary, which is not, which is not a Christian source. <laughs> but I like what I read, because on, on one hand, narcissism is a diagnosable personality disorder for some. And, and when I looked up the narcissistic personality disorder said one of the premier, it is one of the premier diagnoses of our time. And then they said it's a reflection not only of an apparent trend in mental illness, but also of the strains and distortions in the lives of essentially healthy people. In other words, it's where everything's going in culture. I started to thinking, yeah, that's right. I mean, they were telling me from the time I was a kid that I was number one, and I needed to look out for number one. And they were telling my parents, you need to tell your kids all the time, There's no, they're the best thing since sliced bread. They're number one. Always look out for yourself. Don't care. Don't let anybody get, get, get the upper hand on you. You're number one. You're everything. Look out for number one. And this was always the mentality that I, I just heard constantly growing up. And no wonder our whole culture is shifting that way. Every relationship has to be about me. Every relationship has to meet my needs, otherwise it's not a relationship worth having. What if Jesus said that to you? Like, unless you meet my needs, my relationship with you isn't worth having. No. So here's how it works out in David's life as narcissism affects all of us. He's resisting the temptation. I mean, there's not a power equality here at all. Jonathan has all the cards. He's the prince. He's the king's son. David's the no-name who's the latest hero. How's he going to deal with David's rising f- fame as it starts taking the spotlight off of Jonathan? And it begins to complicate his relationship with his own father. Here's how it goes. This is right after David kills Goliath, 1 Samuel 18, verse 5. Whatever mission Saul sent David on, David was so successful that Saul gave him a rank in the army. So Jonathan's father, as the king, uh, starts promoting David in, in his army. And this pleased all the troops. They loved David. They loved working with David. And... Uh, fighting with him, and, and Saul's officers even really liked David. Well, when the men were returning home after David had killed the Philistine, the women came out from all the towns of Israel to meet King Saul with singing and dancing and with joyful songs and timbrels and lyres, lyres. and they, they danced and they sang, Saul has slain his thousands 
and David his 10,000. And of course, Saul really liked that song, right? <laughs> but Saul was a narcissist. As God's spirit was taken off him, it had to be all about him, otherwise it wasn't acceptable. So Saul was very angry. And this refrain displeased him greatly. They've credited David with tens of thousands, he thought, but with me, only thousands. What more can he get but the kingdom? Next thing you know, he's going to want my job. And from that time on, Saul kept a close eye on David. And boy, did he ever. In fact, by the time this chapter ends, um, Saul tries three times to kill David. Once they're in the same room together, and Saul gets so enraged, and the scriptures say because God had taken his hand off him, God allowed, I mean, demonic, demonic influences and impulses to take hold of Saul's life. And he just grabs a sword and in sheer hatred and jealousy hurls it at David. And he misses. And he tries two more times in this chapter to kill him. And he's unsuccessful. And that's when in the next chapter, Jonathan steps in. He makes an appointment with his dad, the king, and he sits down to have a conversation with him. And Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. Remember Jonathan said in so many words in that covenant exchange of clothing and weapons, I've got your back. Okay, this is Jonathan. He's keeping his word. What, what a thing. I think I've had a few friends in my life that really truly had my back. I don't know that they come very often in our lives, but what a gift to have a friend like that. He spoke well of David. Let not the king do wrong to his servant David. He hasn't wronged you. He's saying to Dad, he hasn't hurt you at all. What are you trying to kill him for? What has he, what, what has he done except to, he's really helped you, actually. Well, Saul doesn't listen to his son. In the next chapter, chapter 20, he tries three more times to kill. My adding is correct, that's six times to kill. Tried six attempts at taking David's life. And so, Jonathan meets with his father again in chapter 20. Why should he be put to death? I mean, what has he done? Jonathan is just, he's not giving up for his friend. What has he done? He asked his father. But the demonic influence came over Saul again. And this time he hurled a spear one more time. But it wasn't at David. It was at his own son. In that moment, Saul actually tries to kill his own son. Then Jonathan knew the understatement of the Bible. Then Jonathan knew that his father intended to kill David. Yeah, mm -hmm. Yeah, I would come to the same conclusion. You don't really hear anything about David, about Jonathan anymore, because David has to go underground the whole rest of the book of 1 Samuel. And we'll look at part of that journey next week. Um, the whole rest of the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel, is David running from Saul as Saul repeatedly tries to get rid of him. And Jonathan is now alienated from his father's loyalty to his friend, has really complicated his life. Jonathan, Jonathan um, isn't mentioned for probably the next three chapters. In fact, he's only mentioned one more time as, as David has to go underground and in seclusion. Uh, it doesn't allow a friendship in terms of them being together to happen much more, except that one more time, believe it or not, this is a powerful picture of the God who keeps chasing us, the God who keeps chasing us down, the God who says, I'll have your back. If just, if just we could connect, I, I, I want to be there for you. And Jonathan finds David while he's in hiding. And in verse 16, it says, Jonathan helps David to find strength in the Lord. What a gift of a friend like that. I mean... And it's the problem when we stay too much to ourselves. I mean, people, there are people that desperately need you. There are people that desperately need the Spirit of God in you. And there's also 
people in your life who don't need the relationship they have with you being all about you, but rather in turn, you are strengthening them in the Lord. And then verse 17, this is verses on the screen. Don't be afraid, he said. My father Saul will not lay a hand on you. I, I don't think this is gonna work. I know he keeps trying to kill you, but you know what? You're supposed to be the next king of Israel. And then get this, and I will be second to you. I read that and I go, hope. You mean a strong, warrior, young man, hero, full of faith, could look a friend in the eye and say, I'm fine being second to you. Because this isn't all about me. This is about you. And the two of them, again, made a covenant before the Lord. Jonathan went home, but David remained in hiding at Horus. Just want to put three questions in front of you and then I'm going to ask the worship team to come up. Just, just, I just felt at this point we need to self-diagnose. We need to, like, how could the Holy Spirit just talk to us about where we need to refocus things when it comes to the relational part of our lives? First of all, what, what would it be like to be your friend? <laughs> I want you to try to put yourself in the shoes of those around you. And knowing you, what do you think it would be like to be your friend? Is it all about you? Or um, if they were, if, uh, um, if this was a situation that you just are staying too isolated, that they'd rarely ever hear from you, what would it be like to be your friend? Let's go to work now. What would it be like to work for you? What would it be like for someone to work for you? I know courageous bosses who have asked that question. Like, it's just good. If you're supervising a work team, if you're working with people, once in a while say, what's it like to work with me? And give them permission to be honest without threatening them to fire you, that you'll, they'll fire you if you say the wrong thing. And then, uh, ooh, I've had husbands wince over this one. What would it be like to be married to you? So on Valentine's night, come to think of it, I actually asked my wife that. What's it like mar being married to me? She said something in the vicinity of us getting better. But... <laughs> well, there aren't exact words, but... Well, what's it like to be around you? And then we say, Holy Spirit, could you, could you come? and begin to replicate the life of Jesus in me and, and somehow help me to refocus on my relationships where I'm not keeping too much to myself and making it frustrating for my friends or my marital partner or whatever it is. And at the same time, I'm, I'm not making the relationships I'm in all about me. I never do anything in this relationship, unless it ultimately benefits me. And I'm always just talking about me. And it's just, you know, I must get boring for my friends. I only talk about me all the time. So, so these, I think these are some questions that can just help us focus. What would I be like as a friend? What would I be like as a supervisor? If someone had to work with me, what would it be like for them? And may God give us grace. Jonathan did not keep to himself or make it all about himself. And that, as I've been saying, was just like Jesus. Just like Jesus. So I'd like you to stand with me. And I'd like, we, we started the service by reading out loud. And I'd like you to read out loud these, um, these verses. We're going to go to Philippians. It's, it's what Paul writes to a church he started in Philippi. In fact, I was in Philippi a week and a half ago with Sandy. And we saw the ancient the ruins of that ancient Roman city. It's a very real place. There was a very real church there. And the Apostle Paul writes to them and says some amazing things. And I'd like you to read it out loud with me, please. Okay, all together, verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each to you the interests of the others. 
in your relationships with one another have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That's God doing this for you and saying, could, could you then be like Jesus? And the only way I know to be like Jesus is not just to have his good example. That frustrates me. That leaves me in the dust. But it's to actually receive what Jesus did for me and say, Jesus, like Paul said, have the same mindset as was in Christ when he left everything to reach you. And l let that begin to refocus and transform all your relationships. But it does start with that relationship with Jesus. And I'm, as we sing just part of a song here, just kind of responding to the fact that God loved us that much, I'm going to ask those of you who right now, maybe you're dealing with a tough relationship. Maybe uh, you feel like God's asking you to reach out to somebody and you're, you're not sure how. Maybe you've been really hurt in some relationships. Um, maybe, you know... The way Jesus loves people doesn't make victims out of other people. But maybe you have been the victim of people who've really hurt you in a relationship and you're still trying to find forgiveness. You're still trying to find healing. You're still trying to find freedom from what someone else did to you. And there's healing here. And, and maybe you need to start a relationship. Could be your first time here. I don't know. Could be your hundredth time here. But you still have never really let the love of God translate into a relationship personally with Jesus where you ask him to forgive your rebellion and sin against him and you humble yourself before him and say, Lord, I receive what I don't deserve but what you did for me. And you'd want to join others that come up here. And then I'm gonna, before we close, I'd like to just pray over you if you would like. We're just going to, as we were during our worship time earlier, just have a moment of encountering the life of Jesus. So, and if it's not even a relationship, but you just need a touch from God, I mean, you're welcome just to come as we often do at the end of a service, fill this altar area, and I'll pray over you, and uh, we'll be going. Thank you, Jesus. Let's just sing. Feel free to step forward if you need to start a relationship with Jesus or you want prayer in these areas.
every one of us just lift our hearts to the Lord. Father, we bring you our hearts. If our hearts aren't right with you, we ask you to forgive our sin because of what you did on the cross, taking away God's judgment and saying, I love you and I want a relationship with you. Lord Jesus, if our hearts aren't right with you, we say yes to you right now and no to everything that rebels against you. In Jesus' name, begin to transform our hearts so that we can love like Jesus loved, we pray, oh God. We thank you that you were wounded so we could be healed. We thank you that you were the shock absorber and the victim of everything that destroys the human heart and you bore it for us. And we praise you, Lord, for that love, for what you did. And well, Lord, we pray that you'll help us in our relationships. We pray that you'll help us not to be too distant from people, not to keep too much to ourselves. Lord, help us to know that you want to flow through us, that you want to use us to help others be strengthened in the Lord like Jonathan did with David. He strengthened him in the Lord. And my God, I pray that you will do this through us. We pray for those of us who have been hurt, Lord, by, by betrayal, by people who didn't keep their word, who, 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 who Lord, victimized us, abused us, per, perhaps. My God, we thank you. There's healing because you were abused at the cross, because you were broken so that we might be healed. My God, we find refuge in you. We give you our broken, hurting hearts. You who hurt more than we ever will. And my God, we pray that you'll just put your arms around our hearts. You'll heal our hearts. You'll lift our hearts wherever relational pain has been, oh God. We pray, oh God, for those of us who are married, we pray that there'll be less selfishness and more of the grace and serving love of Jesus in our marriages. We pray for the people we teach in classrooms, the people we supervise at work. My God, that the grace of Jesus, Lord, the need to control will be broken and the, and the Spirit of God will just help us to bring the best out in the people we lead. And my God, we just pray that you'll be glorified through our lives in the name of Jesus. You who said, as I have loved you, so love one another. My God, I pray you'll help us to love you with all our hearts, to love our neighbors as ourselves. Lord, give us grace, Jesus, and we praise you for it. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Come on, sing it. What a father, what a friend, what a savior. We lift our hearts, what a father, what a father. ask Pastor Chris to come and lead it, close us in prayer. Remind you of our prayer gathering tonight, six o'clock, powerful time, always those Sunday night uh, times together, time change next Sunday, uh, remember that, 
It's been wonderful to worship with you. The worship team will still be here and the altars are still open. If you want to just linger, if you want to come up and pray, if you want to stay where you are, uh, you're welcome to. But when Pastor Chris prays, you'll be dismissed if you'd like to go. God bless you. Father, we just thank you for your faithfulness. It's grateful to know that you lead us, you go before us, that you shelter us, you keep us. Lord, we just take this time just to, to say thank you. That you didn't give up on us and that you won't give up on us. So Father, we commit to you. We commit to your word. We commit to keeping our eyes on you, Jesus, to doing the hard things, to having the tough conversations, mending relationships. Because at, at the end of it all, God, we want to look like you. We want to reflect you, Christ. Keeping you at the center of everything that we do. So what a father, what a savior. That's who you are. Love, your joy, your peace that surpasses all understanding. That is who you are and that is what we are filled with. So Father, we thank you. We thank you, Lord. And even now, Father, as we get ready to leave this place and we go back into our, our worlds, our jobs, our families, Father, we pray that you will help us to lead and look like you. Speak like you, move like you, respond like you. Father, we thank you, we love you, and we worship you. It's in Jesus' mighty name. Come on, everybody, say amen. Amen. You are dismissed. God bless you. Come on, single, single.